Hello everyone, uh, my name is Karim Abbaspur. I'm the developer of SWAT Cup, SWAT Cup Premium and SWAT Cup Plus, uh, which are calibration programs for the SWAT, uh, SWAT or SWAT Plus model. We've decided to prepare some video lectures for SWAT Cup programs to familiarize the users with the concepts. Uh, I will prepare several lectures covering many details that will help you to calibrate your models without wasting much time doing uh, many trial and errors. Development of uh, SWAT Cup currently is not supported by any organization, so there is a nominal fee uh, that we charge and that mainly covers the cost of the licenses that we have to buy. Uh, it pays a little bit of the programmers uh, salaries and also uh, it allows us to develop the program further. I try to make the interfaces of all three programs the same so that you can seamlessly navigate from one program to the other one and test uh, different programs and, and different options. We have um, <clears throat> prepared a series of, of lectures uh, beginning uh, with this one, which is the, uh, the first video. It's an introduction to model calibration um, that familiarizes you with the concepts and that makes sure that we are talking about the same thing. Um, in the next lecture, we, uh, I try to build a SWOT model uh, from the beginning and show how to get the initial run which is uh, quite important <coughs> with the model that you have built. Um, in the next lectures, I try to cover elevation bands, uh, lapses, uh, snow parameters, things that you have to do prior uh, to, to calibration. And then in the next few uh, lectures, I will show you how to calibrate different models with, with different situations and so on. Uh, cover a step-by-step procedure that you can follow to calibrate different models. And then I may probably make some videos that show you how to analyze, uh, now that you have created your calibrated model, what can you use it for? To You can use it to analyze land use change, climate change, BMPs, and so on. We'll have some videos uh, showing you on that. Now, let's get started with our first video, which is a short introduction to model calibration. Modeling steps, as you know, um, uh, you have to follow several steps to build your model. The first one being uh, building the model in ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, the next step is you need to calibrate that model, perform uncertainty analysis, validation, sensitivity analysis, and so on. And then at the end, you may want to do some climate change analysis, land use change analysis, BMPs, risk analysis, and, and so on. Model building. So for SWOT, you build your model in arc SWAT or Q SWAT, that is, you use ArcGIS or QGIS uh, to build your model. At the end, you will get a texting out folder, right? I'm not going too much into uh, SWAT model building, arc SWAT or Q SWAT. Once you have done all that, you will get a folder called texting out, which contains all the files that you need to run a SWOT model or the SWOT program, I should say. SWOT is a Fortran program and it uses text files to read uh, the inputs. So it really not much to do after you have built the model with Arc SWOT uh, or, or, or Q SWOT. Now on the other hand, SWOT Cup um, uses that text in out and then calibrates your model your parameters at the end are in a file called parinth so after calibration what you have which consists 
of or makes up your SWOT model is the text in out folder plus parinf folder. These two folders contain all the information that you need to run the SWOT model. Often there is a misunderstanding what is ArcSWAT, what is SWAT, what is SWAT Cup. So I hope that uh, you can become clear on this issue that ArcSWAT is where you build your model. SWAT is a Fortran program that it runs, it uses the inputs generated but by ArcSWAT to run your uh, <coughs> watershed model. And SWAT Cup is a program independent of arc SWAT or Q SWAT or SWAT that it's a standalone program that uh, tries to calibrate your SWAT model. Now when you have built your model or when you build your model we assume that you have used the best parameters in the soil land use database you have used the best climate data that you could get and you have added all the important processes that occur in your watershed in your model. By these processes I mean the reservoirs, water transfers, crop management, irrigation, snow melt, glacier melt, potholes, water harvesting, wetlands, point sources such as springs and and water coming from water treatment plants and so on. Now model building sometimes some of these processes uh, we don't account uh, for everything that happens in the watershed. There is a principle called the principle of correct neglect where you neglect the processes which are not important of or of any consequence in the, in the watershed. But param processes that are important and of consequences, they should be, <coughs> of course, included in your model. Now, you can read more about this uh, in the article uh, which is listed here. I mention this because um, your expected, your expectation from calibration and validation results should be proportional to the goodness of the model that you have built. So you cannot expect a perfect calibration result when you have not included, for example, important processes in your model or your data is really poor. So your expectation should be proportional to the goodness of your model. Now, <clears throat> let's begin uh, by discussing about calibration or uncertainty analysis. Calibration has many names in the literature. It's called parameter fitting, inverse modeling, parameter estimation, history matching. They all mean the same thing, which is calibration. And it is just theoretically very simple. You try to adjust your inputs so that you come, your model simulations are the closest to the uh, observation. So eventually, at the end, this calibration process boils down to optimization of an objective function, such as the one here that says you want to minimize the objective, your objective function, which is a <coughs> function of the parameter set B, which tries to minimize Right, the difference between observed, for example, discharge and simulated discharge. So this is an objective function that you try to minimize. Once you have minimized this, then you can deduce that the parameters that you obtained are probably the parameters that you're looking for if the calibration, if this value of objective function is, is, is in this case, small enough. Now, uncertainty analysis is therefore the process of propagating and quantifying the errors in the model, uh, model inputs or processes and so on, through the calibration process. So calibration and uncertainty analysis are really intimately 
linked uh, you cannot separate these from each other and the reason uh, for that is that if you look at this is these graphs there are 11 discharges here from 11 different data uh, parameters 11 different parameter sets which are shown here so you have 11 simulations these are the different para parameters this is the value of the objective function it's very close to each other in fact statistically they are not different from each other if you look at the parameters they can be quite different from each other so the whole idea behind uncertainty is that you can have very many different parameter sets that give you the same result statistically the same result so here the best simulation that everybody is after the best simulation the best simulation has these parameters now there isn't really a big difference between the best simulation and the next best, best simulation or the next best simulation and so on that's where the concept of uncertainty comes from so if you have one good calibration result for your parameter then you have thousands of good calibration results for your parameter so you cannot pick one of them and say here is my result so the idea that many of you have that now I want to put the best parameter set into my SWOT model and or to arc SWOT and you know do further things it's completely misguided and it's not correct now at this point let me tell you about the deterministic versus stochastic uh, approaches in deterministic approach you give a single value for a parameter to the model and the model gives you a single signal of output like this charge and so on all models are deterministic they take one value for a parameter and they give you one signal but the minute you want to go the other way around that means you want to use your signal like this charge and get your parameter back which is the process of calibration calibration is what it does is takes the uh, your output from the model and tries to find out your observation and tries to find out the best uh, parameter the minute you go the other way around the process becomes a stochastic and you no longer get a single uh, output from this approach but you get a distribution of outputs or a range so in this case would be the output would be our parameters so parameters always have a range when you are doing calibration they are never a single value no calibration program can give you it a single value it can but it won't be correct you've got to consider the distribution in your output which is the uncertainty of your model so you have to carry this uncertainty in whatever analysis that you do with the model and you should not try to get the best whatever that means the best fit and then use only those parameters now <clears throat> next sensitivity analysis the sensitivity of a parameter why are we interested in sensitivity analysis is because parameters represent processes so the reason I'm interested in the sensitivity of this parameter because this parameter represents a process I'm actually interested in that process to know what are the important processes in my watershed so sensitivity determines which process is dominant in the watershed and for that <coughs> we determine the significance of one or a combination of parameters with respect to the objective function now there are two different methods for sensitivity analysis um, in SWAT cup there is a local or one at a time sensitivity analysis in this type of analysis we keep all the parameters fixed 
constant and change only one parameter at a time. So to determine this, what you have to do is you make very simply three simulations with the range of interest of your parameter and you look, you, you see how they look like. So in this case, I'm using CN2 and with respect to nitrate. So I want to see how sensitive CN2 is when I'm looking at nitrate. I do three simulations with these three values of CN2. Uh, the black line, dashed line is my observation, and this is what I get. So from this, I deduce that first, CN2 is a sensitive parameter because every value gave me a very different result. And secondly, I can use this information to get an idea of the range of the parameter, right? The parameter range, the range of CN2. CN uh, many people ask me initially, what should I use for range of parameters? Well, this is one way you can use to set the range on the parameter, is that you do a, one at a time a local sensitivity analysis within a range, and then you look at your results now, when I look at this, it's clear that the best values are, are here, are down here, right? This 0 0.46 is up here, and the other two values have this range down here. So clearly, I would like to be within the range of 0 to minus 4, 0 0.46. Now, there are some observed peaks, which I have to find other parameters that would fit those peaks. But as far as CN2 is concerned, the best range is between 0 and minus 0 0.6. So this information uh, I can use to set my initial uh, parameter ranges. In another example, uh, if I look at, for example, revap, uh, minimum revap threshold, and I do three simulations, similar as before, and I see only one curve here, so all three simulations coincide. So that means there is no sensitivity of, uh, with respect to this parameter. With respect to uh, revap minimum, the model is not sensitive at all uh, uh, with respect to nitrate. So this is not sensitive. So it's. There is no point. I mean, you could include this in your in your calibration or not. It doesn't make any difference. Now, there is a problem uh, with the whole concept of this one at a time sensitivity analysis. It is uh, sometimes useful, but it could also be misleading in a sense that sensitivity of one parameter may depend on other parameters. And here we have fixed the values of all other parameters to something that we don't know if they are correct or if they are not correct. Now to show that the sensitivity of one parameter depends on the value of the other parameter which is fixed. Uh, if I fix the value of my P2 parameter to this blue line here, uh, point here, and then I look at my P1, I start changing my P1, right, around this value, around this value. This curve here is the value of my objective function. So this is my parameter 2, parameter 1, and the objective function here. So I see there is no difference in the objective function. So if I happen to be in the flat part of the objective function with respect to a parameter, then changing parameter 1 doesn't show me any sensitivity. So I may conclude that P1 is not sensitive. Whereas if I had fixed my P2 value to this point here, which is a point that I have a large change in the value of the objective function if I slightly move to the left or to the right, at this point, if I change P1, P1 value within this range, I see a big sensitivity with respect to the uh, parameter P1. So I may conclude that, yes, 
P1 is sensitive. Here I may conclude that P2, P1 is not sensitive simply because of where the parameter P2 uh, is fixed initially. So this is one problem with this approach is that we are fixing all parameters and we don't know whether they are at their true value or not. So we may be misled depending on the values of the other parameters that we have fixed. Now another uh, approach is global sensitivity analysis. In the global sensitivity analysis, we are changing all the parameters at the same time. Now the problem here is sort of similar to the one before is that now we are dealing with ranges of parameters and the parameters are changing within a certain range. And now if I change that range, I may get a different result. Uh, to calculate the global sensitivity analysis, we use a multiple regression computation such as this, where my objective function is, uh, is a constant plus this, uh, my parameters times a certain uh, coefficient. And then you perform the multiple regression and you calculate the t-test uh, of this. And then what we report at the end are the parameters and their uh, uh, t-test and the p-values. And you will get in SWATCOP something like this, which gives you the t-stat and the p-value of the parameters that you use. Now here we want to have a very small p-value and a very large t-value. So the larger the absolute T is that, and the smaller the p-value, that is the more sensitive parameter. Sometimes you may have a large value, a large, I mean, significant value for, for T is that, but the p-value may be very large, not small enough. And that means that maybe the number of samples are too few, and it's just by accident that this parameter has become sensitive, has a large T is that. But if it has a large t stat and also a very small p-value, then it is uh, a sensitive parameter. So as I said, the problem is that in every iteration, the ranking may change. So it's best to report this in the final iteration where you are sure of sort of the ranges. But that's the global sensitivity analysis. Now, validation... Validation is the process of testing the calibrated parameters with an independent set of data without making any further changes to the parameters. And uh, this is, there are two rules that should be followed when you're doing validation. The first rule is that uh, you have to use the same parameter range and the same model and everything the same, right? Because when you calibrate, you're conditioning your parameters on the calibration data set. So you have to make sure that this is not too conditioned on the calibration and it's also valid for a different data set. So that's why validation data set should be different uh, and independent, different from calibration data set. And then you have to make sure that the data that you're using for calibration and for validation are more or less the same in terms of the mean and standard deviation of the, of the variables that you are looking at. So if you're looking at discharge, the average discharge for the period of validation should be more or less the same as for the period of calibration. In other words, you should not calibrate your model for a number of wet years and then try to validate your model for a number of dry years, right? Your calibration data should cover all kinds of climatic situation. So the two should have sort of similar statistics. And also, this is wrong. I mean, people ask me if they can use this uh, for years of 2000 to 2017 for calibration and 2012, 2017 for validation. This is not correct. They should not overlap. They should be independent data set from different time periods. Now, let me cover uh, some concept, important 
concepts in calibration and these are parameterization objective function definition and non-uniqueness or uncertainty now parameterization there are two issues in parameterization or two questions one is which parameters to use and the other one is how to regionalize these parameters so let me explain okay which parameters to use this depends on the behavior of your initial model right i see often people send me questions and so on and i look at their parameter file the parim file and there are like everything is in there like 20 parameters whatever they could find they put in there and try to make a run and hope to get something out of that that is not the way you should do it the parameters that you choose should depend on the behavior of your your initial model uh, that is why we, we need to see that initial run i emphasize that what is the initial run of your model let's see how that looks first before we go any further now i give you some examples if your initial model run looks something like these two then there is no point in calibrating this model i mean there is clearly uh, something is missing something is wrong here either you are at the downstream of a dam or something or your precipitation data is completely wrong because there is a complete mismatch between uh, the two the simulation and the, and the observation so in this case i would just go back to the model and see re-examine my model and the processes and the data and all of that now if you get a situation like this that you have systematically lower base flow so if your base flow is too low and your et is too high then what you need to do is to set these parameters you need to lower these two parameters and you need to increase revamp the minimum revamp this parameter so you need to decrease these and you need to increase that in order to get a higher base flow so from the parameter point of view these are the parameters that you have to change now it may be that this lower base flow is because there is a groundwater flow there is a, an input into your model that you are not aware of there may be uh, point sources that you are not aware of. But from parameter point of view, these are the parameters. But from process point of view, you have to look at the, what is coming into your river from other sources of water into your river. <clears throat> now, if you have a situation like this, where your peaks are systematically low, so if your peaks are too low, then you need to decrease these two parameters and you need to increase uh, CN2. If you have a shift, if there is a shift, a systematic shift, always your peaks of your simulation are to the right, are to the right, shifted to the right, then you need to decrease these two parameters and increase this parameter. Now, if it's the opposite of this, if it's too, too fast, the peaks, then you need to do the opposite, that you need to increase this and decrease those. Finally, if your nitrate, if you're looking at nitrate and you have a situation like this, where your nitrate load is too high, then you need to decrease one or more of these parameters. So the moral of the story here is that you have to look at your model behavior and then choose the parameters to achieve a certain change in your model so don't just randomly pick 20 parameters and you know put everything in a pot and try to get something out of that you have to look at your initial model run <clears throat> so again uh, you choose your parameters based on the behavior of your model now, for more detail on this, you can look at this uh, European paper that, that uh, we have published in, in this journal. 
Now, the other was the regionalization of the parameter. And what does that mean? This is the soil map on the right. This is the soil map of the tour watershed, and this is the land use map. Now, in the soil map, you often have the same soil unit appearing in different places. It's the same soil unit. So this soil unit has the same parameter value everywhere, right? But here you may be under forest, here you may be under agriculture, here it may be pasture, and so on. And when the soils appear under different land uses, the parameters, of course, change. Uh, the soil surveyors don't look at the land. I mean, they don't look at the hydrology to set soil parameters. So those soil units may have nothing to do with the hydrologic behavior of those soils. So you want to be able to change the same soil unit, its hydraulic conductivity value under forest or under pasture or in a mountain or so on. So for this purpose, purpose to regionalize those parameters, we have devised a system such as this, where a parameter can change, its, you can change the value of a parameter with respect to its hydrologic group, soil texture, land use, sub-basin number, and slope, or any combination of these. So this is calibrating a parameter at the HRU level. In this example, x here, it means if it takes a value of v, if, you, if I put v here, it means that you are changing the existing value with another value. If I put a, that means you are adding to the existing value or subtracting uh, a given value. And if I write r here, it means that it's a relative change that you are multiplying the number already the, the value that exists by 1 plus a certain given value. So the value that exists multiplied by a certain value. There are some parameters in SWOT that are spatial. That means they change from place to place, such as soil parameters, CN2, and so on. And there are some parameters that are not spatial, such as groundwater parameters that SWOT uses this, the same the same, unless you have information, of course, you change these parameters, but they are not spatial. And there are some parameters in the basin that is defined at the basin level. So those you can change one value for another value, but the parameters that are spatial, you cannot just set one value everywhere. So you have to be very careful and you have to make those a relative change. Now here are some examples. You can also see these in the manual, so I don't want to spend too much time here, but the, just to give you some idea, you can change soil hydraulic conductivity of the first layer uh, in a relative change. That's what this means. So that's the syntax of how, how you would express this, how you would specify. So here the relative change of soil hydraulic conductivity for layer one layer 2 and layer 4 to 6. So that's the syntax, how you would write that. If you don't write anything in the bracket, things that are many, can take many values, like hydraulic conductivity, can have 10 layers. So those parameters have a bracket and you have to specify the layer. If you don't write a number here, that means all the layers. If I write relative change of soil hydraulic conductivity for layer 1, if soil hydrologic unit is D, if soil texture is fine sandy loam, if soil texture is fine sandy loam and it's under pasture, if it's fine sandy loam under pasture and it's in subbasin number one, two, and one, two, three, then you have quite a bit of flexibility in really setting parameter values uh, and you can use this flexibility. Uh, the thing is that if you go too extreme in this direction, you will end up with too many parameters. And if you go too extreme in the other direction, you can 
generalize, you can lump everything and lose the variability in your watershed. So you have to be careful how you parameterize here. But it's important to note that the spatial parameters should always uh, be relative change in the spatial parameters. You can do the same parameter change in every file. For example, management files. Management files are specified by rotation number and operation number. So you can change the CN value for all rotations, operation number one, or rotation number two, operation number one, for plant number 33, or of all rotations, operation number one, plant number, ID number 33, and so on. Or you can specify a certain file and just change the values in that certain file. Again, you have a lot of flexibility in changing management parameters. Similarly, with crop parameters in the, in the crop.dat file. Similarly, with pesticide parameters in the pesticide data file and so on and so forth and uh, finally the most important one uh, is precipitation I have added this because uh, sometimes you have a lot of missing value and you use WGen and SWOT generates numbers for those missing values and those num generated numbers could be quite wrong so you should be able to to fit some of those numbers but you have to use this option very carefully because if you fit rainfall then you can fit any kind of discharge so you should not use this for fitting your discharge this is only to set some values that uh, you know is different from the value that are reported and here again you have a lot of flexibility to change the value of rainfall for one day uh, for one station or for a number of a station and one day or for all stations and some days and you can change for the whole year the uh, multiply the whole year by certain numbers and so on a lot of flexibility also here to change rainfall so that's what we mean by parameterization here another aspect of parameterization is that uh, if you look at this example and you have three outlets, this outlet is fed by this subbasin, right? So changing values here doesn't affect that subbasin at all. So uh, if I want to fit the discharge here, I can only change the parameters of subbasin number one. So here I look at the behavior of subbasin number one and I choose the parameters according <coughs> to model <coughs> excuse me to model behavior here. For the this outlet, these subbasins are important or are affecting coming into this outlet. So I need to fit this, I need to change the parameters of these subbasins only and again I look at the behavior of model here and I choose parameters that give me uh, the best fit to the model here. This is the outlet of the whole watershed and after I have done this, parameterized this and this, then the rest of these subbasins are the ones that are contributing to this watershed. So for those I can again set the parameters of these so that I can achieve the best situation here. So this is a very important <coughs> parameterization and you really need to follow this in your model to get the best result. Now you can look read more about this uh, in, in this file here and this, this file here uh, this report here has uh, values of soil parameters for different soil texture. So if you have a clay soil, the range that you can use for its soil parameters is different if you have a, a loamy soil. So based on the texture, you can choose a better value for the ranges for hydraulic conductivity, bulk density, and so on and so forth. So I highly recommend that you have a look at this uh, article here. 
Next is objective function. Objective function, uh, there are many, many different objective functions in the literature, and we have 11 of them in the, in the SWAT cup programs. Now here you see the, uh, the sum of square error. Here you see the square errors multiplied. Uh, nice Sutcliffe r squared, chi squared, br squared, a lot of different objective functions. Uh, we don't normally like to use r squared because, uh, as you see, these two signals here have r squared of 1, whereas the magnitude is very different. So, if you want to use r squared, the best would be to use br squared, where you multiply r squared by the regression constant between these two. So you sort of take into account their magnitude as well as the linearity. So BR squared would be a much better option uh, to R squared. And then you have P bias and RSI. I have added these over the years as people asked me. And uh, recently in the SWATCOP premium, we have added multi-objective functions. And what it does is uses these 11 objective functions and tries to maximize such a function. Such a function. Now you can use this to build your own objective function, for example, using R squared, Nash Sutcliffe, and P bias. And with the weights. And the weights we calculate such as this in, in SWAT cup. Now, if you can build, you can set other weights to zero. That means they are not considered. So you can really build your own objective function and see its performance. That's very important. It makes your result at the end independent of objective function. Right now, the results, if I use R squared, then my calibration result is conditioned on the R squared. So it's a conditional calibration result. Whereas if I use many objective functions, then I can obtain an unconditional uh, calibration result with respect to um, objective function. Uh, anyhow. And then you have the behavioral objective function, which is uh, also, it's not included in the premium version, where you can constrain your objective function. For example, if you have your objective function is nice start cliff. You can say, I only want to keep the simulations where the nice start cliff value is larger than 0 0.7. In that case, if you do a thousand simulation, maybe 300 of those have objective function greater than 0 0.7. So you can only work with those 300. So you know that all the, all the results uh, from your calibration are better than 0 0.7. So it's also quite interesting to see how that uh, performs. Now, uh, I would recommend you read more about the objective function and its sensitivity to the parameters that you obtain uh, in these two uh, articles here. Now, let me go back to this graph again uh, about non-uniqueness and uncertainty. Now, a model run is always deterministic as I sh showed here. Calibration is always stochastic. That means at the end, you have a range of values. Always you have a range of values that you have to carry in your further analysis. So again, don't <laughs> write me that you, how do I put the best parameters into the arc SWOT model or into the SWOT model? This is really uh, it's not m meaningful at all, this question. There is no best parameter. You have a range for a parameter, and then that's the range you have to carry in your further analysis. So forget about the, the best parameter and how, you, how to put the best parameter into the model. Although you can do that very simply. Anyhow. Um, again, with the question of non-uniqueness, here you see we have many, many simulations and many parameter sets which are all good simulations to my model. So I need to carry these everywhere in my further analysis of the model. Now, 
An ideal situation is something like this. This is a perfect, non-unique, perfect situation, very unique. I mean, you don't have any non-uniqueness. You have a perfect situation. But we will never have this in practice. The reason is that because of all the errors in the model, you have errors in input data, in the land use, soil, rainfall, this, even the discharge that you use to calibrate your model has a lot of errors in it. You have a lot of simplification in the processes that are included in the model, such as water infiltration through CN2 or unsaturated flow through these bucket concepts. These are very simplified processes then you have missing processes that are completely missing from the model, such as glacier melt, wetland, and many other things. Then you have unknown model parameters, such as CL, CN2, soil hydraulic conductivity. I mean, you haven't measured this for your water should have you. So these are all unknown parameters. And finally, you have the uncertainty associated with the modeler. So you have a modeler who doesn't know what to do and it's not experienced and he's just trying. So be given all these sources of uncertainty, you should not expect to have a perfect model, a calibrated model at the end. And some of the calibrations that involves like uh, sediment, nitrate, phosphate and so on are really much, much more difficult and because of the things that happen in the watershed. I leave you with this example that uh, we, we want, had a project to, to model uh, uh, sediment in a Chinese watershed, the Hai He River Basin, and we really couldn't get anywhere close to the reported observations. So we went to China and went up and down this watershed and I realized a lot of things going on in this watershed, such as road building. Here they cut the mountain to build the road. They take the material and dump it in the riverbed. And you have here, for example, this one example, they dump all these truckloads of material in the river. At the next rainfall would wash away all the fine material, leaving behind pebbles and cobbles that they use again in road building. So you have a lot of things happening which is not included in the model and that is why we could never come close to the numbers of, that were uh, uh, reported as observation because of all these processes. And you, you have a lot of water control in the rivers, this control everywhere, and then you, you may have extreme erosions, you may have extreme conditions where blocks the flow of water into the river, you may have extreme pollution conditions. So a lot of things that happen in the watershed that you're not aware of. And then you try to model this watershed and expect a perfect result. So that doesn't happen. This is another interesting observation at the top of the uh, origin of the Yellow River in China, where uh, the rivers from two different sources join together to make the Yellow River. Now, your expectation, in conclusion, your expectation from the model should be proportional to your knowledge of the model and model parameters should be proportional to the quality of data and processes you put in the model. It should be proportional to the quality of the effort you put into model building and calibration. So don't write me that I have two weeks to hand in my uh, thesis and I need to calibrate my model in these two weeks. There is no way you, you, you can do that. So don't try to get, also at the end, don't try to get a good fit by all means possible. Just report at the end what you have. And that reflects your knowledge and uh, reflects uh, the uh, goodness of your data in the, that you have put in, in the model.
Uh, in the next lecture, I will build a SWOT COP model from the beginning using text in out data, and then we make an initial run, and we'll see what we can do with that model uh, after we see the initial run. Thank you.